The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the sharing of the blood of Christ? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear faithful, these words come from today's offertory prayer, the prayer that will come right after the creed in the Mass. And I found them very fitting for this celebration of the solemnity of the precious blood of our Lord. When we think of our Lord's precious blood, you know, we think of obviously his crucifixion and, and the sufferings that he endured there. But those sufferings were not just something that he was forced into, or it wasn't something that, you know, that he beguiled to do, but rather it was truly done of his own will, as he said that he laid down his life for his sheep, and it was done by him for, as a great gift for all of us, something that we did not deserve at all. That blood that we celebrate uh, in this wonderful feast and for the month of July was a great gift and offering of him because it was the price of our redemption. It flowed from the innocent and spotless victim of the sacrifice that is God himself. Now, why did we need Christ to come and, and die upon the cross for us to be redeemed. Well, it all starts with the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. You see, as we know already, they were forbidden to eat the fruit from the, from the uh, forbidden tree. And the, that one tree that they could not eat from, God told them that if you eat from this tree, you shall die. Now, what did he mean by those words, you shall die? Well, he meant... A couple of things. First off, he actually meant that they would suffer natural death, not instantaneously, which is why the serpent tempted the woman to eat of the fruit, because he said that you know that you that you won't die, meaning in his words, right away. But a natural death would come to them. They were not meant man was not meant to die in his life. Men would have lived his life in the Garden of Eden, and then when the time was right, he would have been taken up by some other means by God into paradise without the suffering of the separation of body from soul that comes in the action of death. Yet, as punishment for sin, death comes to each and every one of us now. And so that was part of that punishment. The second part of that, that death, was a spiritual death. This, this, the original sin that is inherited by each and every single one of us. That loss of sanctifying grace. And that not ability to pass on that grace, which was a gratuitous gift from God. It was a gift that we didn't deserve in any kind of way, but he gave us. And that we lost by that fall in the Garden of Eden. And so now everybody is born with original sin because of that. So there's the supernatural death and the, the natural death. And with that supernatural death came off with the closing of the gates of heaven, with the keeping out of everybody. We had lost paradise, not only on earth, but in eternity by our sin. Yet God in his infinite goodness wants us to be in heaven. He longs for us to be with him in eternity. And so he knew, for all eternity, of course, God knows that the price to be paid for that had to be greater than what was lost. And seen as life itself was lost, the only price that could be paid was something greater than a mere human life. That price was the life of his only begotten Son himself, Christ our Lord. And so he sent our Lord down. He sent his only begotten son for the very purpose of dying. He sent him to shed his blood on the cross. And yet because of that love of Christ, he did not end with that mere sacrifice on the cross, that great, great infinite offering on the cross there. It wasn't a one one time and it's over deal for him. But rather he left us the sacrifice of the mass so that every day we have that sacrifice of the cross. That every day that that precious blood is offered to us. And not just in a way 
for the price of redemption to merit it, but in a way that we can actually be receive it ourselves in Holy Communion, that we take it into ourselves for that those graces that we need to sanctify ourselves, to merit from the sacrifice given by Christ. And so this is left to us perpetually in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is such a generous gift that there's no possible way for us to ever repay it. There's nothing we can do in our lives that would ever give back to him, God, that, that price that he paid for us. Yet, what does he want from us? He wants only for us to merit from that sacrifice. Because he's given us the gift. He's, he's died for our sins on the cross. Yet it's up to us to actually accept those graces, those merits to come to us. We do that by the actions of our life, by living in, a, a sanct, you know, in sanctifying grace, by striving to grow in holiness, by honoring our Lord in everything that we do, and most especially honoring him in the sacrifice of the Mass that he's left us, being faithful to that sacrifice, loving that sacrifice coming as often as we can. One group of people who exemplified this devotion to the precious blood of our Lord to the, and to the sacrifice of the Mass to the most extreme fashion was a group of martyrs whose feast day that we celebrated yesterday, that was commemorated yesterday, and that is the holy martyrs of Gorkum. These men, these 19 martyrs from the town of Gorkum, which was in Holland, um, at that time part of the, the, the Holy Roman Empire, they all were martyred for the sake of the Blessed Sacrament. So what happened to them? In 1572, there was a, a war between the Catholic Church and the, and the Protestants, and even amongst the Protestants themselves, the Calvinists and the and the Lutherans, said, they're all fighting this war, trying to gain territory, trying to, to, to force uh, people out of the Catholic faith and into the Protestant religion. And, there was, and the Calvinist forces hired a band of marauders. They were, they were Calvinists themselves, but even more so they were mercenaries. And they sent them out in order to conquer different cities in the Netherlands. And, so, and they came to the city of Gorkum, in June of 1572, and they raided and pillaged the entire city. You can imagine that, you know, some dark and stormy night, these men coming off of the water and and burning buildings and, and killing people, and all these people fleeing as quickly as they can. And yet there stood, as guardians of the city, 15 priests and religious, who refused to back down in any kind of way at these marauders. They would stand between them and their people. And when these, uh, these, uh, these pirates came, they saw these priests, and being the Calvinists that, that they were, and hating the Blessed Sacrament, they arrested all 15 of them, and imprisoned them, and began to torture them in horrible ways, in order to make them apostatize from the faith, in order to make them to force them to admit that they do no, they no longer believe in the true presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And yet, no matter how many torments they hurled at them and forced upon them, the tortures of various ways, they never, one of them, relinquished the faith even for a moment. There were a couple of priests that were in there that had lived very sinful lives, yet at that moment of test and trial, in honor of our Lord's body and blood in the, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, they refuse to yield, and they refuse to give in to the torments. And then after tormenting them for days upon days, they brought them out and they treated them like carnival freak shows, and they sold tickets for people to come in and witness the battered and torn bodies of these men. And yet, with all the insults hurled there, and all the blows heard, hurled during this time and the, and, the, and the humiliations that occurred to them, they never once wavered. And along the way, there was another priest, uh, John of Cologne, who heard about their trials and left the relative safety of his own monastery, which was not under siege, and traveled to Gorkum and secretly would come into the prison at nighttime in order to give them the blessed sacrament that they may receive 
the, the very body and blood that they were fighting for in their lives. And he strengthened them with that until he too was captured. And in the end, four more were captured to make the total from 15 to 19 men. And in the end, they were all taken to a barn and hung until they were dead. Dying a glorious martyrdom for the one purpose, that devotion to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, that devotion to this very feast that we celebrate in the precious blood, that, that precious blood that all of us receive in communion. So, with that thought in mind, that example of these martyrs of Gorkum, how do we see for ourselves what God is asking of us because of the gift of the precious blood to us? What does he want from each of us individually? Well, probably not the shedding of our own blood, probably not the giving of our own lives. You know, most people are not going to be required to give up everything in their lives for that. But what he does ask from us is to come as often as possible, to be here to honor him in the Blessed Sacrament as often as possible, to receive him in that wonderful sacrament as often as possible. And knowing this fact, knowing that our Lord wants to be with us as often as he can, it come, we have to reflect for ourselves, what do we need to do to be able to take advantage of that? And to review what's required to make a good reception of the Blessed Sacrament. Now, before, a few months ago, we had talked about, you know, different ways of making good uh, Holy Communion. So we're not going to... to about that necessarily, but to a simple review as to what is required in order that we can approach the altar itself. First off is the most obvious. We have to be in the state of sanctifying grace. We have to be sure that we are free from mortal sin. If we receive immortal sin, we receive unworthy. We receive, as St. Paul says, to our own destruction. And we don't want that on ourselves. We don't want to add additional sin. So we humble ourselves. We go to confession. We receive the sacrament of penance and absolution for our sins. And then we approach with full confidence and full trust in God in that worthy receive, reception of Holy Communion. But while we say we have to stay away in mortal sin, we never should stay away just because we have venial sin on our souls. Because those are not barriers to, to communion, but rather those are actually cleansed by a good Holy Communion even. And so they should never prevent us from coming to receive, to approach the altar rail and to receive our Lord. In addition to that, it's required of us that we be fasting according to the laws of the Church for Holy Communion. That fasting is that we haven't eaten any solid food within three hours of the time of communion, and that we have, and we haven't drunk any alcoholic beverage within three hours of holy communion, and that we haven't drunk any other beverage, non-alcoholic beverage, aside from water, up to one hour <coughs> before holy communion. And so long as we maintain that fast, that simple fast there, then we are able to come. But if we violate that, even accidentally, we should stay away and make a simple uh, spiritual communion in that, that way, but, but to, to stay away from that. Because we want, when we receive, receive our Lord, we want to receive him in the most dignified fashion as we can. And to think of our Lord there, you know, kind of resting on top of a sandwich, is really undignified for him. So we keep his, our temple cleared for him to reside there alone. And we, and we follow these rules of the church in order to maintain that and recognizing the true solemn nature of a good reception of the community. And lastly, we think of our attendance at the sacrifice of the Mass. When we come on a Sunday... When we come on a holy day, what is required of us to be able to come 
to receive communion. But we have to make sure that we attend at minimum the three principal parts of the Mass, and these should be committed to memory for everybody. That is the offertory of the Mass, the, the offertory prayer and the, and the offering up of the host and the wine, the, the consecration of the Mass, and the priest's communion. These three are the principal parts of any sacrifice that are made. The offertory is the stating of the intention of the priest to offer up the victim as a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, there was always prayers offered by the high priest before the offering of the, of the heifer or the, or the lamb, whatever he was sacrificing. And these, this still remains now as we offer the ultimate sacrifice of Calvary on the altar. Secondly is the consecration, which is the actual action of sacrifice itself, the actual the coming down of our Lord upon the altar, the actual Calvary happening there and then. And lastly is the communion, the priest's communion, because that is the holocaust of the Mass. That is the complete consumption of the victim, which is our Lord. And those three actions are necessary on days of Sundays and holy days of obligation for us to be able to count us having fulfilled our obligation. And it's because there's an obligation there to be there on a Sunday and a holy day that we are required to attend to those three parts of the Mass in order to consider it fulfilled. And because the obligation to attend is there, that is what prevents us, if we don't come to those things, of going to communion. Outside of that obligation, there is not an obligation to be at those things for a mass of devotion. If you come on a Wednesday that's just a regular Wednesday or a Saturday or whatever it may be, and say that you were working and you knew that there was an evening mass and you weren't able to get out of mass in time to, for the start of mass or to even make it by the gospel or anything like that, but you knew you would make it there to the church in time for the communion part, then by all means come. By all means receive our Lord in, the Holy, in Holy Communion. That's the sacrament. That's an extra communion that you could come to. That's extra graces that you don't want to miss out on. That's a great opportunity to sanctify yourself. It's, you know, I, we want you to come as often as possible to receive those graces. Why? Because... Just as the precious blood was the price shed for our salvation on the cross, the most precious blood, body and blood of our Lord on the altar is the normal means for us to sanctify ourselves in our day-to-day -day life. It is the normal means for us to actually merit from the bloodshed on the cross. And it's there for us to come to. It's there for us to benefit from as often as we have Mass. And for our sake, we should look at our day and see on the schedule that Mass is occurring and say, what possibly do I have that is more important than that? Yes, at times I have obligations. I, if, if it goes on and during a work day and it's during my time of work, then I, you know, I'm sorry, I just can't be there. I have to fulfill my duties of state, and God gave me that duty of my, my state of life, and so I have to fulfill that. He knows that. We know that. That's fine. But how often do we miss a daily Mass because oh, I just can't be bothered to, to, to drive down there today? Or oh, perhaps, you know, uh, you know, perhaps I should just take care of, you know, some of the, the chores around the house instead. And, you know, uh, I'll just be there on Sunday and that's fine. Uh, or just it's a little minor inconveniences that come up. It's not a sin in any kind of way, but it's a missing of an opportunity. An opportunity that you cannot measure. An opportunity that you cannot put any kind of bounds to. An opportunity of grace that is infinite there. An opportunity that we saw in those martyrs of Gorkum, that people were willing to die for. That people were willing to risk their lives to bring to another. And for us, it makes our own inconveniences 
<coughs> seem a little bit smaller in that light, which is a good thing, because perhaps that reflection will bring us here more often, even if it brings us to one more Mass, that it's all worth it. So reflect upon that. See, when can I come? How can I make more use of this great gift of our Lord? That price that he paid for my redemption. That price that I can witness and receive every time there's a Holy Mass here. And try to make sure that we merit from it as much as we can. Knowing that ultimately that is how we save our souls. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.